Hi, and welcome to today's Career Exploration Series. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, today's topic will focus on the field of education. My name is Dr. Joe Tuitt, and I'm going to be your host today. We have with us an expert panel, and they're going to share information with you today about their college pathways, their careers, up-and-coming opportunities in the field. And what I love most about this program is you're going to have the opportunity to ask your questions um, that, that you may have for our experts. So again, um, think, be thinking about those questions, get them ready. Um, following our introductions, uh, we're going to open it up to questions. So you can drop those into the chat box if you're watching here in the Zoom room. And if you're watching this on social media, you can drop those questions in to the comments, or you can email me at jt u-i-t-e at bsu.edu and I'll put my email address on my name header there in just a moment for you. So what do you say? Let's get started. Ruth, would you kick us off with introductions, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Ruth Bowers. Uh, I am a 1998 graduate of the Academy. I uh, went to Purdue where I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry um, with an environmental chemistry specialization and a psychology minor. Um, because I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into, say, environmental health and safety or education. Um, but I was pretty sure at that point that I didn't want to teach at uh, the high school or middle school level, that I wanted to teach in higher education. Um, I went on to Penn State to pursue my uh, PhD. Uh, but partway through that, I realized that I was spending way more time in the classroom than I was in the lab. And I really, really loved my, my teaching experience there. Um, I decided to switch over to uh, the education program there, and I got my master's in education in curriculum and instruction and my high school teaching certification um, during my remaining two years there. Um, I have worked as an adjunct at uh, Penn State and, uh, let's see, Gustavus Adolphus College, uh, Alfred State University, um, Alfred I'm sorry, Alfred State College and Alfred University. And um, I even took a little sidetrack as a dog trainer for a little bit. Um, and my dog is actually right here with me right now, um, desperately wanting to be on camera. Um, and uh, now I am working as a full-time lecturer uh, at St. Mary's College of Maryland, which is a public uh, liberal arts uh, college in Southern Maryland, and it has the feel of the academy. So I absolutely love uh, teaching here. Um, my students are uh, motivated to form their own majors and form their own clubs and advocate for themselves, and they do independent research, and it's just fantastic. But I mostly teach first-year students um, because my interests really are at that high school to college transition. Um, Definitely goes back to my roots at the Academy of, of having that experience and um, being able to share like safe failure with my first year students. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I'm Sarah Finn. I am, um, I went to the Academy, I'm an alum from 2012. Um, after the Academy, I went to Ball State and pursued um, a bachelor's in elementary and special education because I thought I was gonna work with um, adults with disabilities because that's what I was doing at the time in high school in the first couple years of college. And uh, I got convinced by a student I was tutoring at the Academy my senior year that I should be a teacher. So she convinced me. Um, and then I went back to Ball State and pursued a master's in curriculum and educational technology. Um, I taught in Muncie for six years in a gifted high ability program. So I got to use my academy experience and teach them young instead. Um, and then uh, most recently moved to Bloomington um, and taught two years of sixth grade social studies. And I just... Um, started to move back towards Muncie and I'm going to be a stay at home mom for two months and a substitute teacher um, to finish out the school year. So. 
Thank you, Sarah. Rhonda, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Good afternoon. And thanks for being patient. I had some tech glitches getting up and on Zoom. Um, so hi, my name is Rhonda Gamble. I am a 1996 alumna from the Academy. I've had a bit of a um, roundabout path with education. I started out in business, dropped out of college, joined the Marine Corps, which uh, made my parents very, very happy. <laughs> um, so I've done um, had some military backgrounds, finished up a degree from Drexel University in history and politics. Um, and like every good person with a degree in history and politics, I was either going to go to law school or become a teacher. So I went to um, and applied for a teacher education program at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where I earned a master's in citizenship education and secondary education. I taught public high school in both inner city Philadelphia and then also the suburbs um, for about six years. And then I, at the same time, I had gotten out of the Marine Corps and I joined the Air Force Reserve. So that kind of been doing that for about 20 years now. Um, from there, I taught high school, like I said, for about six years, social studies, loved it, loved the students, the parents, not so much. Um, and then I, uh, decided to go back to school to earn a PhD in curriculum and instruction at Indiana University, brought me back to the Midwest. While at IU, I was fortunate to work and um, teach, be a teacher educator for first year, or not first year, for third year, students working towards their certification. And then I was able to get into international education, work at a Center for International Ed, where I got to support education and emergencies, particularly working with places like Afghanistan and South Sudan, um, which meant a lot to me, having been to some of those places, um, being deployed there, getting to see firsthand the impact and the importance of education. Um, I didn't end up finishing the PhD. Uh, life kind of distracted me. So I earned an ed specialist degree um, in curriculum and instruction. Um, I activated for a while with the Air Force, so kind of put education on the back burner. Uh, and then when it came time to start looking for work again. I am now the department head for a mass communication foundations department at an, um, a center called the Defense Information School here in Maryland, um, right outside of Baltimore. And uh, we teach initial entry service members from all five branches, public affairs, communication, visual information, I'm unfortunately no longer really teaching. I manage teachers. So I've got a team of about 70 military service members, civilian contractors, civilian GS instructors. And the neat thing or the interesting thing about that is some of them have advanced degrees. Some of them have never taught a day in their life. So we've got to get them spun up and ready and competent to, to teach um, kind of a young service members and some pretty neat, uh, pretty neat and exciting um, content. So we teach graphic design, multimedia, photojournalism. So it's something different every day. So thanks. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Jen Marcus and I graduated in 1993 from the Indiana Academy. And I went on to Indiana University and I graduated with a bachelor's of science degree in secondary ed in Spanish. But I also picked up an English as a second language minor because it just was a few extra classes to get that. And I did spend a year abroad in Spain while I was getting my degree. After graduating, I taught English language learners in grades three through five at Chandler Elementary in Goshen, Indiana. It's a Title I school there. And um, I always knew that I wanted to go back to school. And initially, I thought I'd do a master's in elementary ed. But after working in an elementary school, I realized I didn't want to spend all day, every day with the same kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of work better on the high school model. So I went and um, I got a master's in library science. I like that because I could stay in schools, but I could also maybe work at a public library or a college library or a special library. After graduating with my master's that I got at Bloomington as well, um, I moved to Wyoming and um, my husband's job brought us here, but I was lucky and I got into the school system and I taught Spanish for three years in a Title I junior high school. And then a high school library job opened up in the same district and I worked there for 14 years. A lot of people don't 
necessarily know this, but you really teach a lot as a school librarian. So I taught on average about 320 classes a year covering information literacy and research skills and also doing reading and promotion. And then on top of that, you still do all the background work of running the library. So you select books, you catalog books, you, you do all of those things in the background as well. I had to keep track of my budget. I ran a book club, I ran um, school-wide reading programs. And then uh, my last two years there, uh, they also kind of dropped the one-to-one -one iPad initiative on us. So I did all of the frontline troubleshooting for about 1500 iPads. Um, and just a couple of years ago, a job opened up at the local community college and I was ready for a change. So I applied and I got it. And at this job, I'm the library liaison for all of the health sciences and wellness programs, as well as education and psychology. I still do teaching. I still select books. I've, I've had to do a lot of on my own training because I don't have a medical sciences background. So that's been interesting, but it's been a really fun challenge. And I've kind of now taught at every level of education <laughs> and people ask me, what do you like best? And I say, um, well, I really can't say that there's one that I like best. There's something special about each level and each environment. And I've enjoyed teaching all of the different ages. So I don't really have a favorite. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Jen. And then last but definitely not least, Kelsey, your turn. Uh, hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, I currently teach uh, toddlers. So my class is two and a half to three years old. Um, I teach at uh, the Goddard School of Westfield. I took a very meandering path to get here, though. Um, so I started, I did my let me back up. I graduated from the academy in 2009, and then I went to Indiana University and did all sorts of majors, and then I finally settled in on education and got my degree in secondary education English. Um, from there, and but I did my student teaching experience in adult education, so I did my student teaching with um, people getting their GED from, so anyone from like 16 and I had some students that were like 70s 80s that were just this was their goal before they before they they're gone they want to they want to get their GED so that's what I did for student teaching and then I graduated and didn't really know what I wanted to do so I ended up back at the academy and I was a student life counselor for five years there um, which was a lot of teaching in lots of different ways um, I don't think I need to explain that but I lived on third floor the whole time I was there. So go third floor. <laughs> um, so then I, when I left the academy, I briefly worked at like a suicide crisis hotline, just trying out something new. Um, and then I, after pandemic hit and I was like, what am I going to do? So I was kind of just experimenting and I ended up um, at a Head Start preschool, which I was like, I had always been against working with little little people because I was like you know why but I found that I really loved it and I think it's so important to have people that are really good educators in that age bracket so um that's kind of the brief synopsis of what how I got to where I am now I'm currently working on my CDA so that's kind of like uh, it stands for child development accreditation I always forget the A, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, and that's just kind of the next shows that you're good at what you're doing, basically. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I absolutely love this panel. I mean, we have such a broad variety of, of backgrounds and how you got to your different positions and all different levels of education. Um, there are uh, not only education, but different levels that you're teaching. Um, so it's absolutely awesome. So with that, um, let's open things up for some questions, shall we? Uh, just as a quick reminder to those here in the Zoom room, if you have a question for our panel, just drop that into the chat box. You can either drop it to me privately or you can put it in the group for everyone and I'll present it to the panel. If you're watching this on social media, you can drop that question or those questions into the comments and we'll be sure to get an answer back to you. Or you can email me at my email address, which should be showing on my name plaque now. Um, so do I have anybody that wants to kick us off with that first question?
as you're thinking about your questions and getting those typed into the chat box. I do have a pre-submitted question um, that I'm going to go ahead and share and uh, let our panel answer that one. Uh, so the question from this participant, um, why did you decide to work in the field of education? And specifically, um, why did you choose the age and or subject that you're that you're currently teaching? I'll start us off with this one. Um, I became a chemistry major because when I took AP chemistry my junior year of high school, um, I barely squeaked by with a B and I realized I, I found the printout that Dr. Adams did of our grades. <laughs> like, oh, that bell curve. Um, I, I didn't do my homework. And, um, and I realized that lesson my junior year of high school was, oh, you have to do your homework to master a subject. And when I was sitting at my living room table, you know, applying for colleges, I was like, I'm going to be a chemistry major because I know I can do better than I did before. And I had an opportunity um, through the academy to go and work in um, as a lab assistant um, for some televised labs that were broadcast at that time. And um, I learned so much and I wanted to... Um, show that I could do that. And then in terms of the level, I don't institutionalize well in terms of like a high school, typical high school environment. Um, I remember when I was student teaching, like a big thing for me was my reflections is I cannot do this. Like I can do this now and I can finish out this semester and I'm good at it, but I could not do this long-term because there were such arbitrary rules. Like the school I was student teaching at had three floors but only like three or four minute passing periods between classes and they wouldn't allow stu students were not allowed to wear sandals or open heeled shoes. And I asked, well, why? And they said, well, it's a tripping hazard in the stairwells because they're rushing so fast to get between classes. I'm like, well, why? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Just change the time. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of those arbitrary rules I don't deal well with. And I, I really am truly fascinated, as I said before, with that, that high school to college transition, right? Your know, brain is still very much developing, but also capable of a lot of higher level thought. And so you really have to work with the students on learning how to take care of themselves so that they can learn their best. And so I am, I am the weirdo chemistry teacher who, opens up my first lecture with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, um, you know, regularly just really, really checks in on my students to make sure that they are well overall. I'm trying to remember the whole question, but um, I wanted, I really love teaching little people because um it's it's the time in anyone's life where so like between three and five that's when your personality is being set so the influence you have on a kid helping them to learn like the social emotional stuff you know abcs and reading and math we can catch them up on that later like ideally we don't have to but like being able to be that person that helps them understand the world and interacting and becoming a good person, like that's the coolest thing to me. And I love seeing kids make that growth process. Now my kids are on like the younger end of preschool, but like I still see my kid, they're still in the same building and I love seeing their growth and they'll still come say hi to me. And also in a really, you know, not narcissistic, but like, I really love hugs. So like, just getting all the little hugs and like, the pictures and it just is very day to day validation that like, you're making someone's day. And you know, like it, it, a smile from a kid or a laugh from a kid can just make you happy. You know, I feel like there was another part of that question. but That's why I ended up doing what I'm doing.
I came from a family of teachers, kind of just always knew I wanted to be a teacher. They have recordings of me teaching my stuffed animals when I was little. So just always knew that I wanted to do that. So when I got to college, the choice for me was like, what subject area? And I met with an advisor and I really wanted to do history. And his question to me was, how many coaching certificates are you going to get? And I said, what do you mean? He said, the history, if they hire you as a history teacher, they're going to expect you to coach sports. So it's kind of something to be aware of that when you are hired in the public school system, there are extra duties. And so um, I ended up just thinking, well, I don't really want to coach. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'd be very good at that. Um, and so I thought about what class I liked next. What was my next favorite subject? And it was Spanish. So that's what I did. But I will say I found my true passion in library science. I'm passionate about teaching people information literacy skills. So sometimes it takes a while. I still get to teach. There's that aspect of my job that I still love, but um, I finally found the subject that I love the most. It took a while. <laughs> I um, did not always think I was going to be a teacher. My mother did. Um, like she tells me all the time, I knew this was going to happen. Um, but I was dead set for the longest time on working with um, people with developmental disabilities. And then um, senior year at the academy, I tutored a little girl who had come from Korea. Um, and I told her the day I was going on my tour to Ball State that I was going to do psychology because that just made sense. Um, and actually I was a little afraid to go into education because I felt like there was this um, stigma of academy kids don't do that. And <laughs> all of my friends were going uh, to IU and were doing really big things. And I was like, okay, well, if I do psychology, that will be academic. And yes. Um, but Grace um, convinced me, no, you should be teacher. And then I went. Um, and then all my experiences at Ball State, I was a college mentor for kids. Um, I did camp counseling and all these things were with third graders. So I was dead set. And even in my student teaching got placed with third grade, um, thought for sure, this is what I'm going to do. And um, I student taught in Muncie and uh, at the very end of my student teaching, um, there was a substitute position for the high ability fifth grade teacher uh, at the time. And I pl planned maybe three weeks with her uh, while she took students um, to Washington DC and then she was moving. Um, and then she uh, really enjoyed having me and put in a good word. And I ended up with fifth graders um, and it was perfect because they really are like, just like academites. And now my, my first students, actually, I have like three or four who are at the academy right now um, as students. So it's kind of fun to see whole circle and see their, their pictures and their updates of them being there. Um, but now I'm, I was with sixth grade this last year. Um, and I think I just really enjoy middle school age and fifth grade age because they're getting cool, but not too cool for you. Um, they like to joke with you and um, leaving yesterday, yesterday was my last day with my sixth graders. Um, Kelsey said she really likes hugs. And I realized sixth graders still do too. Um, they still, they still need you just enough. Um, and they can be goofy and humorous with you. Um, so I'm hoping to continue with this age group, but I think I could probably jump in other places too now because um, my children are the age that Kelsey teaches. So um, been all over the place now, but that's how I ended up where I am. And I really like it. I think I'm the last one to go. And I, I kind of stumbled into it. I knew I definitely didn't want to teach young children. Um, high school seemed to make the most sense. And having had two very different experiences, I came from a very small town in Indiana where, you know, like, 50 students in a grade, there wasn't a lot of creativity in the instruction. And then I was fortunate to have Mr. Stewart and Ms. Haynes um, and just really show me what good curriculum and good instruction looks like and developed a passion in history. So I kind of stumbled into it that way, wanting to, to bring that. When I left public school teaching you know, and, and taught at the university for a while, I loved getting to work with teacher educators and, and when I say the best job I ever had was working for the Center for International Education, we would bring, it, it's absolutely true, we would bring in educators from all over the world. These were um, adults, university professors, teachers, helping them improve their craft 
I really developed a passion for that. Um, I would love to get back into it at some point in time. And, and I hate to be the one to say it, um, but it doesn't pay well. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, it's money's important, right? Uh, so being an administrator working where I do now, I, I have a quality of life that I wouldn't have if I had stayed working in international ed the way that I did, uh, which hurts me a little bit, uh, but I guess I maybe sold out my principles in some, some capacity, but I also don't have a panic attack if my car needs a repair or I need to call a plumber. So there is some comfort with that. Uh, so I do find the goodness in it though, getting to work with and develop young service members, um, not only the ones going through our courses, but the young adults who are teaching them as well. So there's still a mentorship. There's still my opportunity to help make them better. I work at a place now where I have a training budget that I would have never had at a public institution. Um, I can send them to classes and for certifications. And that is like the coolest part of my job uh, is helping them walk away from their tour um, at DEMFOS, the Defense Information School, better than when we got them. Uh, so there, there's some benefits to that. I kind of stumbled into it, just very, I never knew the place existed, um, threw a resume out there during COVID and they hired me. Um, so, you know, it, it's a little bit different being an administrator than it is being, you know, an educator, but I still find ways to, to mentor and develop the people that I get to work with. So, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, the next question that we have is, what is it like getting a degree in special education? Am I the only one who did? Oh, okay. Um, so the great thing about mine was that it was a dual major. Um, so Ball State has one designed where you take your elementary and your special ed at the same time. Um, I am so, so, so thankful that I did um, because I ended up having a child with special needs. Um, but the classes are really aligned the same way. Um, the difference, you end up with um, two student teachings. So I did a student teaching with um, third and second grade split classroom. So I had two classes at once, like two grades at once. And then um, I did eight weeks of that and then eight weeks um, in a kindergarten through second grade special education classroom. Um, it was a lot of fun because I got to do um, a unit on chicks and life cycles and we got baby chicks and they just melted and loved it. Um, but as far as the programming goes, it was a lot of learning about a lot of different disabilities and a lot of ways um, to accommodate those because you have to think about um, the physical. So we had classes where we would look like look and learn at um, about adaptive technologies. Um, we had coursework that was specifically learning about how to differentiate for different groups of kids. Um, and it ended up being so helpful because when I ended up teaching high ability students, kids are not always high ability in everything. Um, and actually, a lot of my students in my fifth grade class were twice exceptional. So they would have um, a giftedness in one area, but a huge deficit in another. Um, so I was super thankful that I took that dual placement uh, because I was able to help them with their weaknesses and, and feel strong in those areas that they struggled in. Um, but the, the programming is wonderful because you're going to, no matter what you teach, you're going to have children with special needs, no matter what. Um, so I was really thankful that I opted to do that. And the only reason I did was because I was afraid I wouldn't like teaching and that I needed to jump out to psychology. I would have some of those special education classes done. So I was trying to plan for the work. I so, will add, oh, go sorry. ahead. I will add that when I did not do special education as like a specific major, but when I was at IU, all of my education classes had that built into it. So like, you know, we learned IEPs and 504s and, you know, when we did like a technology class, they were like, these are adaptive technologies and they're good for this person. But like sometimes an adaptive technology is, designed or built for a specific group or subset but it's helpful to everybody so like I feel like and I was at college you know 10 years ago at this point but it's built into the curriculum now where you're still going to be learning somewhat not necessarily specialized but about 
special ed and integrating and you know like all of that stuff and what it looks like in schools now okay thank you so much um, as a quick reminder, if you're watching here in the Zoom room and you have a question, just drop that into the chat box, either to me privately or to everyone in the group. And if you're watching this on social media, you can drop those questions in the comments and we'll be sure to get an answer back to you. Or you can email it to me and my email address is in my nameplate. All righty. So the next question that we have for you is... What would you recommend a high school senior do if they're interested in education but aren't sure if that's what they want to do? What are some ways that they can learn more about what it all entails that you would recommend? Great question. Yeah, around teachers. Um, when I was an academy student, I was, um, during May term, they had a tutoring experience and it actually ended up being the school I worked at <laughs> for my first job. And I didn't remember because we took a, a Muncie transit bus downtown Muncie and went to the school and we had to walk a few blocks to tutor, but just be around kids. Um, and if you're able to use your May term, if you're an academy student um, and make some connections that way. Yeah, I was a Girl Scout uh, for 12 years. And so my summers were spent doing summer camp. My, you know, my weekends were spent, uh, you know, like once a month, you know, doing lock-ins or some some activity where I was working with younger kids. Um, my mom was a teacher and I, you know, would volunteer in her class. And again, <laughs> I also had the experience of, I don't really want, I when I was younger saying, I don't want to be a teacher. And my mom saying, yeah, it's going to happen, <laughs> right? And um, I, you know, teaching at summer camps, uh, even in college, tutoring uh, while you're in college, many schools will offer um, education as a, a minor or uh, some, a dual enrollment. Um, I know at the college that I work at now, um, St. Mary's College of Maryland, we have a master's, um, a master's in teaching. And so we've got this MAT program where students can just uh, spend one extra year on top of their uh, four-year undergraduate degree to get their teaching certification. So we have it, we, like a lot of places will have these things built in so that if you decide partway through your undergraduate uh, degree, that that is for you, especially based on summer experiences, um, that, that you do have options to get that before you leave. So that's always worth keeping an eye and an ear out for because uh, in so many places, we're so, such in desperate need of teachers um, that a lot of states have made it easier um, and schools are really trying to take advantage of that. In Maryland, we just had um, a law go into effect where starting salary for first year teachers has to start at $60,000. That is the minimum yearly salary. And so um, there's, there's just this giant push um, for quality educators right now. I do think um, colleges and universities have gotten better about getting education majors out into the field much earlier in their programs. I think they were seeing people get to student teaching and realize this isn't what I thought it was. And that's kind of late to be trying to make a change. So they try and get you some early experiences now. I would say volunteer. If you can't get into a local school, a lot will have like reading tutor programs and things that you could volunteer for. Check out local boys and girls clubs. They do offer after school tutoring there too. So there's lots of places that you can start getting experience working with kids and see if you really, really like it. But I do think it's important to try and get into a school setting if you can, because it is it is a very specific environment that is regimented by bells and you, you need to see if you like the full overall environment and not just working with kids. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Seeing if you can shadow a teacher whether it's at Burris or you know like see what they're doing when they're not just in front of a class because there's so much more that's part of being a teacher you know like I spent an hour last night just cutting things out so that I can laminate it and cut it again and that's not just because I'm a preschool teacher I'm sure Sarah does that too where she just sits and has to do things like that 
at home because there's no other time to do it. And like a kind of a sad reality of being a teacher is like balancing school and home and you know, like what part of your time at home are you giving up for school slash work? Because like there's only so many hours in a day at school where you're also responsible for all of the tiny people. So like getting able, getting yourself in with a teacher where you can shadow them and see what they're doing when it's not just I'm doing the thing I really love, which is being in front of my class and imparting my knowledge is important because like there's a lot of extra stuff that teachers have to do that so that we can do the stuff that we love to do. Yeah, exactly. I think that education, it's, it's a quote, I don't know who says that education has the misfortune of being something that looks very easy to do, but is actually very difficult. And it is all of the behind the scenes stuff um, and having the chance to work, you know, in teacher education. Anytime the first time somebody plans a lesson, it goes way over and understanding what goes into creating a good, effective, engaging lesson. It's not just, you know, Sage on the stage up there um, talking and you impart this knowledge. It's the, the different tips and tricks um, on how to meet those students where they're at with the knowledge. And so getting the chance to work with a veteran teacher who can kind of show you that behind the scenes, like all of these wonderful ladies have talked about, it's critical in, in realizing just what goes into being effective and you know a quality educator. One more thought I had. If you are interested in like early ed at all, you only have to be 18 like to work with tiny people in Indiana which like questionable sometimes, but if you wanted to get a job, you know, during the summer at a daycare or at wh wherever you can kind of put yourself in that spot, talk to some of that, those teachers of that age range, because like where I work, we have school all year round. So I'm going to be doing the same thing all summer that I do during the school year. So like, if that's an age group that you're maybe interested in, like, you can start doing that now if you wanted to. I'd say too, another place where you can gain experience working with young folks is museums. If you have a local museum, they are always looking for people to support their educational programming. Um, and it'll give you an idea of some of the things that go into that without the grading, which is nice as well. Um, one of the things that I don't think anybody realizes is the amount of time that it takes to effectively grade and the hours and hours to provide that that positive and effective feedback to students as well. The museum educators are amazing and um, always looking for folks to volunteer and support their programming. I had one more thought too. Um, don't be afraid if you are interested in something else, pursue it first. Um, I had two colleagues that pursued other things, one who did business and, and he did the transition to teaching program in Indiana. And he's a wonderful teacher. Um, he teaches in Daleville, which is right down the street from the academy. Um, and then I had another friend who um, they loved high school science and they didn't think they wanted to be a teacher. They wanted to go into the academia and the research first. Um, so if there's something else you are interested in pursuing first, it might inform you as a teacher to have that experience and then you can transition to teaching later too. Great, thank you all. Um, we have our next question ready and that is, <laughs> how do you handle dealing with parents who are all up in your business? <laughs> I'll start. Um, it's a big part of why I left uh, education. I taught in um, two very distinctively different environments, both uh, inner city, uh, where the parents were, you know, struggling to survive in some cases or, or disengaged, and not all. And that's a broad generalization. There were many wonderful parents. And then I also taught in um, a very affluent school district outside, and so the response and the reaction was was very, very different. Um, the best advice I can give is to document everything and make sure that your administration has your back. But I left education 15 years ago. I left that part 15 years ago. So I beautifully 
um, due to a, a law called FERPA, uh, which is kind of like HIPAA for educators, don't have to deal with parents because these are adults and um, they manage their own lives. So I haven't had to talk to a parent in probably 10 years. Um, so I will turn it over to folks who do. <laughs> um, Oh no, FERPA is my favorite too. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I teach first year college students, and that it always comes to a point at the end of the semester where a student's um, impression of their uh, performance over the semester does not match reality, or the impression that they have relayed to their parents does not match reality. And like you said, I document everything. Um, in my first semester, uh, first year chemistry course, uh, I send out a weekly email that tells the students where they're at with regard to progress. And um, there are key points in the semester where I check in with them and, you know, I say, hey, you're, you're getting behind, you've got to come see me, or, you know, I've reached out to get you more support on campus, please take advantage of it. And um, then at the end of the semester, you know, if a parent complains, there is an office that takes care of that for me, of people who are much better at that than I am and who have um, who have all the FERPA releases on file and they know who whose parents they're allowed to talk to and not. And um, I've established that great trusting relationship with them where, where those um those staff members know that I have reasons for everything that I do. And they also know that I am um, trying to do as much triage as possible earlier in the semester to get my students help. And that if students aren't taking advantage of that help, that that is on them. And so um, they're able to really have that, that realization with the student or the parents of, sorry, that's not what happened. And here's the paper trail that says it. So. Um, yeah, that's another great thing about higher education is, is just not dealing with that. I would say um, over communicate and partner really early. Um, if you're really clear about your expectations and that sort of thing very early, um, most parents will hop on board. And I've taught in two different communities, um, one very urban title one, one rural, um, and even with middle schoolers. And the other thing is, um, understand that every parent's first reaction is to protect their baby. Um, and I didn't get it until I was a parent. Um, so when you interact with parents, um, come to them as, you know, I believe in your kid first, L let me understand where you're coming from. Um, sometimes they just need to get it all out before they can have a rational conversation about anything. Um, and kids will twist the truth. Um, everyone's perception is their reality. Uh, so, um, sometimes you, you have to be a listener too. You have to be willing to understand where they're coming from. And every person and every parent that you deal with has gone through education and has had a different experience with it. And some of them are not great. Um, so you are behind in the game before you ever even met them. Um, so building those partnerships really early. And then also if you ever feel like, um, something was difficult with a parent or your gut feels upset after a communication, just loop your principal or your administration in um, because then they'll have your support. Um, they'll have the support for you. Um, but also I will say, understand when it's okay to step back, um, protect your own mental health too, because sometimes it's really hard to take criticism. Um, and it took like probably five years of teaching before I got comfortable with that, um, that not everyone is going to like you and what you choose to do, and that's okay. Thank you. Oh, Jen, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All righty. Um, we have our next question, and I, I want to mention real quickly, though, um, before I share this one, that we um, probably only have time for maybe two or three more questions. So if you're holding back, go ahead and drop those in the chat box. Uh, if you're here in the Zoom room, you can drop those to me privately, or you can do them to everyone. And if you're watching on social media, you can drop those questions in the comments, or you can email it to me at my email address, which is there on 
my name tag or name plate. All right, here is the next question. I've heard that as a college professor, okay, so that's going to our college teachers here. Um, I've heard that as a college professor, you have to do a lot of research and publishing. Is that actually true? And do all colleges require that? Oh, I can take that one. Um, so I am in a position where I am a lecturer. And um, this means that I am expected to teach a 4-4 load. So I've got four course equivalents in the fall, four course equivalents in the spring, um, and I'm on a 10-month contract. So then I basically have two months off in the summer. Um, I am not required to do research. Um, if you want to be on a tenure track, um, going up the ranks of assistant, associate, and professor, um, then you would. And my husband is in that role. He has now gotten tenure at two different institutions. Um, and uh, it does require uh, research uh, in your field. Um, but the expectations of that research are different at different levels of institutions. So you're going to have um, R1 institutions, um, think the, the big colleges, the big state schools that you know about that offer um, PhDs, um, those are going to be the ones that are going to expect research as a major component of your evaluation for tenure and promotion. Um, a smaller school uh, like where we have been teaching, um, those are going to include it, but they're also going to include, um, you know, major uh major uh, concentration on your uh, teaching abilities in and out of the classroom. And so a place like where we're at now, it's going to include like how you're mentoring students in their research, right? And so are your students, um, you know, going and presenting their research you know, as undergraduates? Um, are you, um, you know, supporting them through those, those things in terms of that mentoring? Um, and then, uh, you know, then things like advising and, and service also account for that. So it really, it does vary by um, both level of institution and what you're willing to do, right? Like right now, I don't have, I, I'm on a three-year contract. So I'm actually in the second year of my three-year contract and I'm up for renewal next year. So I need to put together a package um, talking about things that I do for outreach like this. Uh, things that I do uh, in terms of uh, uh, on campus, uh, participating in groups um, related to um, classroom equity and teaching practices, um, you know, things that I attend in terms of professional development, um, things that I've created in terms of my classroom, right, ways that I've changed my classroom teaching based on my evaluations and things like that. And so that's going to be the main portion of mine. Um, so we really have to think carefully about what type of level you want to do before you commit to that. My husband um, has some health conditions where he doesn't want to travel internationally. And so for him, going um, to a small school like this gave him that, that comfort where, okay, I don't have to travel internationally and present at international conferences to do my research, and I can do it at, at a smaller scale um, to where I will get tenure. So I can answer in terms of librarians. It It's interesting at some universities and community colleges, you're considered staff, and then you, you're not on a tenure track. At others, you are considered faculty and you are on tenure track. Where I am, I, I am on tenure track, and um, we have to put together a portfolio at my community college. It does not require original research for regular classroom professors or librarians. We have to show growth in four different domain areas and gather material to prove that. Um, it, at some colleges, in order to be a librarian, you actually have to have two master's degrees to even get your foot in the door. You have to have your master's in library science and a master's in another subject area because they want you to be a collection specialist in that area. Um, so again, it just, it does really vary by institution type um, and then what that individual institution values. Um, at the community college level, there is much more of a focus, I think, on teaching. And so that's what our portfolios will focus on is more on the teaching aspect rather than, than research. So there's a variety of opportunities out there. You can work at the college level and not necessarily have to do original research. 
Great, thank you so much. All right, this next question is actually, actually has, looks like one, two, I think three different pieces to it and it's going to everybody. <laughs> so the question is, I'm looking at different college choices. How competitive was it to get into your college? What were the requirements? Did you feel prepared? And I think that did you feel prepared part, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think the did you feel prepared part was after graduation and going into the classroom. I, um, with mine, I felt prepared both for college and for after college. Um, I got the classroom a lot um, and I was around kids a lot. Um, as far as, will you repeat the first two parts, Joe? Sure. Um, let's see. How competitive was it to get into your college and what were the requirements to get in? Oh, um, with, as far as competition goes, um, I was a Ball State student. So being an Academy alum was really, really helpful. Um, I ended up being able to get a full ride to Ball State. So it was um, very helpful. Um and then as far as what it took to get in, um, I mean, every school was different. Um, I was accepted to all the colleges that I applied to at Indiana. Um, we just had to do well on our SAT. Um, and honestly, my PSAT scores from the academy were already sufficient. Um, so. Um. I did not apply to a lot of schools, but I will say um, when I was an SLC, I could tell that the process of going to college was so different even from when I was applying to schools in 2009. And that was only, you know, like five years earlier, you know, I did five years of college, but like the whole gambit that you seniors have to run now in order to figure out college and where you're going to go and early decision and blah, 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 blah. There's so much more that you guys have to deal with that we guys, that we did not have to experience. And I'm sorry, that's your lot in life now. Um, but as far as like specifically like the school of education at IU, I did um, like a very small program and I was trying to look up if it even still exists. It may or may not, but it was called Community of Teachers. And it was like a small group where instead of doing just like straight classes all the time, we did a seminar as a group. And you were in this seminar for the whole time you were in the School of Ed. And you did an apprenticeship, which meant we start, we, we got our placement or picked our school. And we were at that same place for like... I, I did mine. It was the same place I ended up doing my student teaching, but I was there for like two years before I was student teaching there where we had to go there at least once a week and had this constant experience with the same teacher. And the other part was that we had to make this giant portfolio to show like, hey, I am a competent teacher. Um, so getting into that program, like I had to interview, I had to like show like why I wanted to learn in this different style than just like straight classroom experience. Um, and I, st there were still class requirements, but like, I really liked that alternative because I am more of like, I'm going to go do the thing and learn how to do the thing instead of just reading. So like seek when you're choosing a school, if that's, something that's important to you see what kinds of ways they're teaching you to be a teacher because like i feel like a lot of teachers don't actually learn well just sitting and being talked to we would rather like do the stuff and practice and try so when i finished that program i did feel like i learned a lot about how to be a teacher and what kind of teacher i didn't want to be so I think that gets to part of the question you were asking. I felt very well prepared to go to college and I was accepted into all three schools that I applied to. No, well, okay. I was accepted to all three schools that I applied to. The Naval Academy rejected me because I didn't apply. Um, <laughs> 
um, my father sent off for information about it for me. And I have, I think I still have the letter filed away in some memory box of, you know, at the Naval Academy, we have rejected you for the following reasons. And it's like, did not apply, right? Like, whatever. Um, but I, <laughs> but application in 1997, like to apply to Purdue, it was literally like a page and I just wrote front and back and that was it. Um, I do remember going to Purdue and talking to their um, head of chemical engineering at the time. And she scared me to death. I was, I did not want to do that at all. Um, that was too intense. Um, I did marry a Purdue chemical engineering graduate though. Um, and a Burbuff graduate. So um, we're, we're Indiana here. Uh, so I, I want to say that like the, the, the enrollment landscape for higher education right now is shifting rapidly and um, you really should pay attention to things that are um, perhaps in uh, inside higher education and um, what's the other one that we all have access to as educators crap anyway I'm sorry there, there's another good magazine that's online that's that's good for getting that information. Um, but, you know, I know at my school, we have an 80% acceptance rate and, um, you know, we really care about retaining the right students. And so a lot of those hoops that students have to go through is really making sure that we're getting the students get chronicle for higher education. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, chronicle of higher education. That's great, great resources on kind of understanding the college process and how it's changing so rapidly. Um, but making sure that we have students who have, you know, that resiliency, that grit, that ability to stick with something um, and the ability to network and reach out for help. Um, because, you know, that's that's where we see students really struggle is if they aren't accepting of help um, and if they're, um, and if they don't have purpose, you know, anytime someone, a student says to me, you know, that they are truly undecided in their major, um, I worry because they are not going to succeed in my class. And I can tell like from the first week of class, right? This is, this is one of my early red flags that I, that I check. And I know that I'm going to have to keep an eye on that student um, because even if they are like undecided, you know, on paper, they're going to have some passion. And if they don't have that passion, um, then then they're just going to be flopping all around. And, you know, for some of us, yeah, we have we are undecided about some aspects, but you have to have passion for something and have some direction for something. And so that's really what colleges are looking for um, is is making sure that you have some idea, but to understand that it's OK if that idea changes that you know where to reach out to get the help that you need to kind of steer that ship in the right direction. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, th that's, that's my advice from this perspective. My advice on getting into college is 25 years too late, but right now, <laughs> right now that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, same. My my experience of applying to schools is so different and very similar to what you just said. So I wouldn't be able to speak to that. But I would say that the university experience differs based on from campus to campus, from location to location. And if you find yourself at a place or a program that you are not happy with, use those resources. And if you're still finding that it's not what you want, there's, you know, nothing wrong with taking a pause and looking for another, you know, transferring to another school. Like I transferred from my freshman year. I mean, maybe don't drop out and join the Marine Corps. Maybe do. If you want to talk that, I'll be more than happy to explain why pros and cons. Um, but I did transfer schools after that uh, and found a school and a program at Drexel that I absolutely loved and, and a community and friends there that I didn't get where I first started out. It just wasn't the right fit. And I was fortunate that my parents were able to help me support me in that. Um, as far as the school that I selected to get my teaching um, education and licensure through, 
I weighed cost benefit analysis. Um, it was the more expensive program, but it was the quicker program. So it got me in, it was very intense. I earned a master's in 10 months, which makes up for the undergrad that took six years. Um, and I like plowed through it and we were day one thrown into that classroom experience and teaching in different environments. So I, I got that experience early on from the master's program. And then the same thing, um, you know, as I was applying for the, the PhD programs, I, I picked the wrong program for me. I should have gone into a more um, administrative line, into like a more EDD, like a uh, practical clinical program where I picked that research path and I did not love the research, which um, kind of prevented me from getting my feet under me and, and finishing that up. So I made the wrong choice. I made the best of it because of the experiences I had so I'm grateful for it, but um, don't be afraid to walk away, which is probably not the best advice you want uh, <laughs> to hear on a career panel, but sometimes walking away and finding what really, really fits, it opens up a lot of opportunities as well. I always used to tell academy students, you don't have to decide right now what you are going to do for the rest of your life. You have time. I am in my 30s and I still do not, I mean, I'm going to do this for a while, but like, do I think I'm going to do this forever? I don't know. But like, what you're choosing right now, like, yes, it matters, but it's not going to decide your whole life path. You have time to change your mind. You have time to try things. Like, please explore. Please find the thing that is right for you and makes you happy. Yeah, I would um, also say a lot of schools of education are, they are not filling all their seats. So they are also in some ways competing for you to choose them. So Kelsey went to a really unique program in, at her see, see what each of them offer. Like in Wyoming, there's one state university. So there's not a lot of choice here about where you're going if you're gonna go for a public university, but you've got several wonderful ones in Indiana. Really investigate those education programs and see what the differences are. And um, they really are competing for you as students too, because they have falling enrollment in those programs. That's just, there's a teacher shortage in lots of states across the country. And that's a terrible thing, but for you, it's an advantage <laughs> when you're applying to those education programs right now. Thank you all so much. I, I hate to cut off this conversation because it's going so wonderfully, but I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. So a huge thank you to each of our panelists today for uh, joining us and for sharing so much incredible information. And thank you to all of our participants as well. You guys have some fantastic questions. Um, just a quick mention, our next career exploration program will take place on April the 20th and will focus on science and research. So if you haven't signed up for that one yet, I encourage you to visit our website at academy.bsu.edu and then click visit. Um, and then you'll scroll down and you'll be able to see that. And then very, very quickly, hot off the press, I will soon be adding another career exploration link um, that was going to focus on filmmaking. We have some incredible experts um, that are working in uh, the movies and TV right now, and they're going to come and talk about their experiences in the areas of stunts, directing, producing, writing, and so much more. So again, that's a another awesome opportunity. Um, so again, I encourage you to uh, go to that site, academy.bsu.edu slash visit. Again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our participants. Have a beautiful day.